We will start in two minutes. Adjust yourself.
coming to the comfortable easy position and allow your eyes to be closed welcoming yourself to this journey the journey to explore the new dimensions the journey to know ourselves take a couple of deep breath let your mind to be here to be now bring your mind to be focused on the breath Now let's bring the palms in Namaste. Let's invoke the divine to all the goddesses, to all the divine energy, by five Om and then opening mantra. Inhale. Repeat the invocation mantra after me. Om Devi Namo Namaha. Om Devi Namo Namaha. Together, eight more round. Om Devi. Namo Namaha Om Devi 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 Namo Namaha Gently go your head down, surrendering yourself to this cosmic energy, invoking, connecting to this ten goddesses. Gently rub your hands. Giving a gentle touch to the eyes, to the face, and gently open your eyes. Namaste, everyone. Welcome. So, I am Bodhi here. I hope you know me. Welcome. Namaste. My name is Lisa, and I'm very happy that we're all here 
together today. We are so, going to... Are you ready to explore this journey together with us? Okay, so let me ask you a few questions. You can reply either, you can unmute yourself or you can reply by, by in the chat also. Let me ask you your purpose of life. I know it's very complicated question, but whatever you know, your purpose of life. Still exploring. Honestly, I don't know. I haven't do it. That is a good answer. Yes, yes. Tell me. Either unmute yourself or just in the chat. Not clear. To find peace, I am trying to figure out, to understand what life is, still searching, to find out what's the purpose of my life. Yes, we are here, 24 people. Purpose of your life? To have a blessed and blissful life. Nice. Little more. Ask this question to yourself. Okay, so let's try to see the purpose of our human life, what we understand actually. I will show you a video here, a small video, and we'll try to understand what is our purpose and how we can go more beyond this purpose of our life. Mm, okay. So let me know if you can see the screen here. Yeah. This is the human life. This is our journey actually. We are just seeing it again. Mm -hmm. Finish within one and a half minute. Our life finish. You see how short is our life. So this is our purpose of most of the people. They live in this purpose. They take the birth. They go to the school. They go to the university. They earn money. They have marriage. They have kids. This, 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 and again die. Again the Life is start and again we die. It's like a circle, the vicious circle we call of the life is continuously happening. But being a human being, we can expand this purpose of our life. We can go a little more beyond what we understand, what we think, what we normally see around our society, that we can go a little more higher, a little more understanding, a little more developing our consciousness. That's why we are trying to create this kind of a space through the different practices. So 
our awareness from the limited mind, we can expand ourselves. So let me tell you about this course, this Mahavidya, and what is the purpose of this entire course. So if you look at our life, this entire creation basically, in the beginning, if you go in this little bit around the science, so if the science say there was the Big Bang happened. So before the Big Bang, what was there? That was completely space or you can say there is just the nothingness, the pure consciousness. And when the Big Bang happened, this entire pure consciousness, it shrink itself. And from that unlimited, it become limited basically. Also, if you see the birth and birth cycle of like how the baby come in the womb. So before the baby coming in the womb, what was the face of the baby? It is just in the nothingness. From that nothingness, that baby come in the womb when the egg and the sperm meet. So from that infinite space, that space contracted itself and it become as a baby, as, as a creation basically. So that pure consciousness itself shrink itself and it become limited basically. And the purpose of our sadhana, of our meditation, of our journey is to go from that limited consciousness to expand ourselves. You can see this in the entire creation of the life. You can see as a plant, as a seed form. You will see the seed. The seed is there. And when the seed is growing, it's, it's the sprout is coming, the tree is happening. So this expansion is happening. So that is the real purpose of our life, basically, to expand ourselves. And when we contract ourselves, there is a pain, there is a misery, there is unhappiness, there is a sadness, there is all sorts of problem we face in our life. But once this, we start expanding, there is the bliss, there is the anand, there is the satchit anand, there is a pure, unlimited space we have. So our journey here is from the limited consciousness moving to the unlimited consciousness. Like the journey was in the beginning was the unlimited to the limited. Now we have as a human being, we can expand our awareness. And that is the difference between the human and the animal basically. If you look at the animal, animal having all sorts of emotions, all sorts of fighting. If you look at the in the wild animal, what they are doing, they are fighting with the food, with the they want the security, safety. Same happening in our life as a human being. But the human being having the possibility to grow, to reach to that unlimited space, to reach to that space of bliss, basically. No other cre creature in this entire universe have that power to reach to that unlimited space. And there is beautiful saying also, the devatas or the the higher dimension, the devatas especially, or the divine beings who are living in the other lokas, basically, they have to take the birth as a human being to go beyond, to experience that, the pure consciousness. So the human birth is very precious and we can use it with our consciousness to make it more and more and more and more and more expansion. And that is basic purpose of our our sadhana basically and that's why we are using this time the 10 mahavidya so 10 if you see the name the 10 mahavidya so i'm going to dissect the name why the 10 what is the meaning of maha what is the meaning of vidya so first try to understand the meaning of vidya so vidya is again a kind of knowledge a kind of understanding that we are not limited in our life that we need to grow in our life, that we need to expand. The Vidya is the divine knowledge. And through the understanding of these 10 different goddesses, we can increase our vibration, we can increase our consciousness basically. So Vidya means the knowledge, knowledge of something which is beyond ourself. So that is the Vidya. So 10 is again, the 10 here is, uh, the 10 goddesses which are coming from the tantra basically they're called the wisdom goddesses 
So 10 representing the 10 direction. So if you know, we have the 10 direction, the east, west, north, south, up, down, and other sidewise. So 10 direction representing by the 10 Mahavidya, the 10 goddesses. So we can bring the knowledge from all these 10 dimension, basically 10 direction. That's why is the uh, 10, 10 goddesses are there. And few other points are also there. So 10 Mahavidya. So these 10 Mahavidya representing, they come from the, basically the lineage of the Tantra. So Tantra is again a very, uh, a concept basically developed around the uh, era of uh, 5 or 6 BC. So Tantra is a part of the spiritual practice where the the real meaning if you understand the tantra is again the expansion tantra tantra means we are using our body we are using our mind to expand ourselves basically so tantra tantra means the expansion so we are using the practice from the tantra which are related to the 10 different goddesses and we are expanding ourselves Let's try to understand a little bit concept about the goddesses. Why there is so many gods and goddesses in the Hindu religion. If you see, you will get confused like this. Lots of god and goddesses. Some people worship the Shiva. Some people worship the Krishna. Some people worship the Tantra Devi or Shiva or Parvati. So why this? Why this different kind of god and goddesses? So let me ask you one more question here. Uh, who are in engineer here? Write down. Engineer, any kind of engineer, software engineer, mechanical or... Okay, Anu is engineer. Anu, which kind of engineer are you? Engineer, okay. Manoj is also engineer. Mechanical engineer, okay. Good. So Manoj is the mechanical engineer. If I ask Manoj, can you make a software application for me where I can post my video, where I can like kind of similar kind of Instagram or something where I can reach more people. And if I ask Anu, can you make some, some kind of device for me, like kind of a machine where I can go for walk basically, where I can, I can sit and I can walk easily can you make similar kind some kind of maybe robot or some design kind of possible or some kind of machine related to your mechanical whatever you know about yeah so Manos is saying he don't know about the coding and Anu is saying she she can use her mechanical things she can she can work so if you look at the this point of view, so we all have some kind of knowledge, we all know some kind of understanding and according to that we can make something. Some people they can cook very good food and some, some people they can make good software, They can some people they can work outside in the field and some people they can work in the laptop. So as a different human beings, we have the different knowledge, different understanding and we can work in a different ways. Same way, if you look at the god goddesses, they have different powers, they have different siddhis, they have different knowledge. They, so when we worship a certain kind of god or goddesses, we are connecting to their qualities basically. So that's what we are going to learn in this entire god, of course. When we go to the Kali, when we go to the Tara, when we go to the different goddesses, we are going to understand their quality and we will also connecting to their quality, what quality we need in our life. If you're going to the Kali, what is her quality and how we can bring her quality in our life. So that's we are going to understand in this entire course, basically. That will be, we are going to do next month. Uh, I think, yeah, next month, especially. So this, we are here for that reason. Basically, and let me see if there is some point I am missing. So, Tantra Ki. Hmm. 
so in other way if you see the purpose of our life one purpose i i told you is like growing is like expansion in the vedantic term there is a four purpose of our life that is called the four purusharth basically the dharma arth kaam and moksha so arth means we need the money we need to survive in this physical world so we need the that is called the physical need we need the food we need the house we need all kind of little comfort so we can be better we can go little higher into the practice and we also need the emotional connection with ourselves also with others also so that is called the kama basically so arth kama and also we need the dharma dharma means the righteous activity the moral the positive activity the the moral support basically the mental psychological need that is the dharma and the last is called the spiritual need or the moksha so that is the four purushartha according to our vedanta the arth kama dharma and moksha so by understanding all this somebody so we need to understand this we need to grow in all these four direction not just on the physical need that i need money i need the safety i need the security but we need to expand ourselves through the kama through the righteous activity and ultimately reaching to the spiritual journey spiritual need the moksha basically so that we need to understand by all these practices what we are going to do why we are doing this practice so this little bit here let me go through the basic purpose of this entire course is to extension of our self to understanding all this ten mahavidya and to expand in all the direction in all possible direction whatever we can do so that is the role of the vidya here to reach to that infinite space so now let's close our eyes for few seconds bring your awareness back on yourself after understanding little bit about what we are going to practice on this ten days with the close eyes bring your awareness to your limit limitations it can be your physical limitation it can be your mental limitation or your emotional limitation or the spiritual limitation we believe ourselves that we are very limited very small can you just be aware of your limitation remember we have all seed we have all the possibilities the choice is in our hand what seed we want to put in our life the seed of happiness the seed of growth the seed of bliss or the seed of contraction suffering the contraction is the disease the expansion is the happiness the health Again, open your eyes. Write down your limitation now on the chat. Where you feel limited in your life, something is bothering in your life, some emotions or 
people around you. It can be anything. Write down the things you feel limited. Emotional attachment. Letting go of my negative past experiences. Procrastination. Relations, negative mindset, lack of self-confidence, physical restricted lower back, negative thoughts, mindset, finance, Finance, yes. Mm, so many finance. Health. Don't want to give up. So you see how we get contracted by ourselves. How that unlimited, the pure consciousness getting limited. And we have all this limit, limitation basically. It can be related to the health. It can be related to the emotions. It can be related to the mind. It can be related to your situation you are facing in your life but if you start acknowledging yourself start understanding about yourself that you are not limited by this small small things what will happen if you die in next second you see life is just very short and we try to focus on this very limited things why not we can expand ourselves that we've just shifting our awareness not from the limited point of view, but from that infinite point of view. And once you shift your awareness to that unlimited space, you will see all kind of things, all kind of, we call it Siddhis basically, but I'm not going into that Siddhis. I'm telling you just the normal Siddhis about related to your health, about your happiness, about your all kind of situation that will get improve, improvement by itself you are not focusing on improving anything you are focusing on more higher purpose and the small purpose the small things will automatically get solved once you have focus on the higher dimension and that is we are going to practice that our focus is on not on the limited things but on that pure consciousness to all these goddesses to all this and mahavidya basically so, so now I invite Lisha to explore more on this dimension. I will make her host and then we will end after she finishes. We will end with a short meditation. And now she will explain a little more deeper about what we are going to do in this course. Thank you so much. Yeah, questions you can ask uh, of when we are going to end. So. Keep your question now with you. Okay. Yeah. You can also always write in the chat, not if, you know, not to forget it. Thank you so much, Bodhi, for this very beautiful introduction. So I will share my screen with you. One second. Um, and then we are going to discover a little bit about... Um, the single Mahavidya, like their aspects and qualities. Um, and first of all, I will... So there are many different ways of structuring.
um, of structuring the Mahavidya. Like it depends very much on the tradition um, you look at. So, um, and there are also many um, structures that only include certain Mahavidya, three or four, and like really focusing on different aspects like speech or something. So we will not go into that today. I will present you the most um, common structure that we can find. And that is basically related to the chakra system. And also you can see up here, this is Kali, Tara and Tripura Sundari. And they represent this triangle, the, um, the three gunas. I'm sure um, you heard about it. Um, tamas, Sattva and Rashas. And these, they're basically um, qualities or aspects of creation and they are inherent in everything that is basically alive. And as such, these three um, goddesses, Devi, they represent these three gunas and they are inherent in all the other Mahavidya. So that's why they have a little bit of a singular um, position um, beyond um, the other ones. And then um, we have here um, Bhuvaneshwari relating to the Sahasra, Bhairavi, Arya Chakra, the Chinamasta to the Vishuddhi, Dumavati, the Anahata, Bhagalamukhi, Manipura Chakra, and Matangi, Swaristan, and the last um, goddess um, is Kamlatnika and she is associated with the Mulatari chakra, the root chakra. So in order, um, and we will also go into that more in detail um, next week when we um, speak about, um, especially Kali. Um, so in order for the creation to happen, there needs to be these three gunas, these three devas, like they need to be first there. And in, yeah, they also represent in a way a complete cycle of creation. Um, I'm sure you have heard of the Trimurti, um, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, like um, creation, sustenance and destruction. So that's all already contained within these three Mahavidya. Um, now I will go um, a little bit um, through every single Mahavidya and we will start with Kali. So Kali is this the first, she's always the first um, Mahavidya representing the power of consciousness really in its highest form. And she also especially represents time and now we have to understand in order for creation to happen, there needs to be time. Like we need time in order to measure events. So Kali is this time, like the prerogative of creation. And when we think that time is life, like life is our movement in time, then Kali is also life, prana, like that energy which moves through us and through everything in the universe really. So Kali is the power of action and transformation. And she really also destroys that which is not ready or willing to change, that which objects to change. Um, one thing which is very different, for example, in the Christian creation story and in the Hindu or Tantric creation story is that in Christianity, for example, there are seven days and God created the entire universe within these seven days and it's finished. In Hinduism and thus also in Tantra, it's really like it's a continuous movement, like it's unfolding, it's happening again. And we are in fact like an active part of it. So Kali is there to, for example, if there's something which obstructs change, she basically cuts that, she destroys that in order that the creation can flow continually like that the Supreme Consciousness can unfold continually. And 
in that sense, like in that sense that she cuts whichever obstructs to change, she also represents death. But of course, there's always like um, a positive aspect behind it. Like we need the destruction in order for creation to happen again, to make space for the new. So Tara, she comes second immediately after Kali, and she also closely resembles Kali. And um, it's interesting, Tara is prominent in Tantric Buddhism and in Tantric Hinduism. And especially in Buddhism, she has many aspects. Like there in Tibetan Buddhism, there are 21 aspects, different aspects of Tara, almost a bit like the Mahavidya, but just Tara. And in her um, Tantric form, in the Mahavidya form, she is more um, a fierce manifestation. So we said that Kali is like the Supreme Consciousness. And in that sense, Kali is already transcended. But Tara, she is transcending in this moment. She, she is on the way. And as the ultimate obstacle that we have to cross is our own mind, Tara really provides us with the power to take us beyond like all these, I don't know, noises and turbulent waves, um, which in are nothing but a fragmentation of the divine. Um, so she really can help us to transcend this and go beyond it. So we said Kali represents time and Tara in that sense represents sound. Um, she is the feminine form of Om, and I'm sure probably all of you know about Om and the importance that it holds both within Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, for those who don't know, I will say quickly something about it, but we'll also speak about it in more detail next week. So Om is, um, in a way, the unmanifest field behind creation. Um, like the mantra Om is the essence of the Supreme Consciousness. Like we always in the beginning and in the end of a prayer or a practice, there is always Om and she represents this Om, like this space that really is under the underlying vibratory support of creation. Um, Tara also represents speech and knowledge. And particularly the higher forms, there are four levels of speech um, and Tara represents the higher ones. Um, I will say later when we speak about Matangi, something else about speech as well. So this is Tara. The third goddess still within this um, three guna triangle that I showed you earlier is Tripura Sundari. And she's mostly described as extremely beautiful and attractive and erotically inclined. Mostly she is depicted as a 16 year old, very, very young um, girl and very vibrant and shining. And she's often said to give desire and to suffuse creation with desire, to be the goddess of desire. And if you think about it earlier, when I showed you the triangle about the three gunas, she represents Rajas, and Rajas also is it's not only action, but also desire in that sense. And Tripura Sundari has many names, and I will um, give you the translations of some of them. Um, uh, the desirable one, she who is filled with erotic sentiments, she whose form is the desire of women, she who causes emotion, she who's in chance, she whose form is sexual desire, she who overflows with desire and with pleasure. So that, yeah, you can imagine what kind of goddess she is. But it's important to keep in mind that when we speak about beauty, this is also not so much about like to perceive about some distant creator in a heaven beyond or something. Um, but it's really about the revelation of our own eternal and infinite self in every single moment of perception. 
So in that sense, Tripura Sundari represents the ultimate beauty of pure perception, which arises when we see the entire universe within ourselves. And when we see all of nature as a reflection of the reality of that divine consciousness, that kind of beauty she represents. Um, like a vision that everything is divine, not just like the gods and goddesses, but that we are divine, like whatever surrounds us is divine. And this again relates to the continuous unfoldment of creation. It's like an active act happening in every moment and we are being part of it as divine beings as well. Um, and so her name is Tripura Sundari. So Tripura really denotes this threefold nature. And in Hinduism and the Vedas and Tantra, there are many, many principles and contexts which refer to a threefold nature. Um, we will speak about that in more detail next week. But for example, I will just note um, one. So Tripura Sundari um, undertakes the three principal cosmic functions, which I mentioned earlier, of creation, maintenance, and destruction. And it is said that she performs these functions by herself, or she creates and directs Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in these roles. Um, so that's one of the aspects which relate to her threefold nature. The fourth goddess, and now we are already within the chakra system, who relates to the Sastra chakra, is Bhuvaneshwari. And I mean, if you look at it, she really closely resembles um, Tripura Sundari. Um, the difference is that Tripura Sundari, she is in the worlds and at the same time she transcends them. But Bhuvaneshwari, she is really identified with the manifest world and our experience of it. So she is in the world. She does not transcend it as Tripura Sundari. That's like the main difference between the two. And so Bhuvaneshwari means, in a way, like Ishwari is queen or ruler or deity. And Bhuvana is... Um, universe or realm of being space um so in a way she is the queen of all the worlds she is the queen of the universe and in that sense the entire universe is her body and all the beings like us and everything else are ornaments on her infinite being so she does not only um, create the world, but she also enters into, into them and sustains them, supports them, nourishes them. And in that sense, she is the, like, the divine mother, the all pervasive force, which is permeating the entire fabric um, of creation. And yeah, in a way she carries all the worlds as a flowering. There is again this um, like very active aspect of the creation. Um, she carries all the worlds of her own side nature. So Bhuvaneshwari um, really represents the concept of space. And she is the receptive spirit who gives space to allow all things their place and function. She's the cosmic womb that gives birth to all the worlds. And so as space, Bhuvaneshwari is complementary to Kali, who's time. And together, they're the two main forces of the goddesses, both as the infinite and eternal. So Bhuvaneshwari, you have to imagine, she creates the stage on which then Kali performs her dance of life and death. And as the stage, she, like Bhuvaneshwari, is also the witness, the observer, and the enjoyer of this dance of Kali. Um, as she represents space, she also represents the void, peace, place, and again, the, the, like the directions in general, but the 10 directions um, particularly. 
So now we come to Bhairavi. She, as you can see in this um, image very nicely, she possesses the brightness of a thousand rising suns. And she is the personification of light and fire. And of course, because she's a goddess, she represents the victory of the light. So you can also see she does not like, contrary to, for example, um, Kali and Tara, she does not carry any weapon. Um, like she doesn't need it. Her weapon is the light. Um, and she's the goddess who is returning from her destruction of all demons or negative forces. If we translate Bhairavi, like one translation means terrifying. And it is really this um, powerful and energetic form of the goddess. There are some people who um, name her as the most fierce manifestation of the goddesses. And in a way, she represents transforming heat or radiance, which is tapas. That's a principle we will also speak about next week more in detail. Um, so she transforms this into divine energy. And in a way, I suppose it might be a bit um, frightening because she really has the power to burn away and destroy all the limitations that Bodhi was speaking about earlier. And not just the limitations, but also the illusions of our like own egocentric existence. So Bhairavi also represents um, divine anger and wrath, which is interesting because that's also something divine that exists. And that's like a quality uh, manifested in the goddesses. Yet like her wrath or anger is not like randomly directed to, I don't know, any sort of desires, of course, but really toward the impurities within us or the negative forces within, within us, which try to interfere or prevent our spiritual growth, really. And in, in that sense, her um, force and activity is really necessary to guide us, but also to protect us. And as we already now um, like learned in several of the Mahavidya, that creation and destruction, they're really two fundamental aspects of the universe. And they're equally dominant in the world and in a way also depend upon each other in a symbiotic fashion. And Bhairavi embodies the principle of destruction in that sense. And it's interesting because like, if we look, for example, it's not only destruction of like a very active destruction as in destruction of evil forces or negativities, but also really sort of when our body declines or decays or like nature, like a tree has its lifetime and then it decays, right? So this also is Bhairavi, this natural, inevitable, irresistible force. And as such, like if we look around it, like Bhairavi, she's all over. Um, like this, this, this force that tends towards dissolution. And which again is really important in order to create space for the new. Um, Bhairavi also, like she represents, like she's associated to the Agya Chakra in that structure of the chakra system. Now to the Vishuddhi chakra, the throat chakra, the goddess Chinamasta is related. And as you can see in that picture, like she has a naked, headless body. And in her hand, she holds her own severed hand in the other scissors with which she most probably cut her head, her head. And with her severed head via the stretched out tongue, she ecstatically drinks the central stream of blood which flows from her headless drunk. See it here. And then the other two streams of blood flow into the mouth of her two attendants. 
Additionally to that, she is standing on the body of another female figure who is making love with a male who is lying beneath her. So Chinamasta, whose image really is a severed head, is the goddess who causes us to cut off our own heads or to dissolve our minds into pure awareness. And as such, she brings transcendence of the mind and represents the non-mind state. In a way, like empty, like shunya, the shunya state. And freed from the limitations of the mind, which we all have, the consciousness can realize its true nature beyond death and beyond sorrow. Therefore, we really do not need to fear losing our, either our bodies or our heads. Like in a way, if we really go down to it, there are mere restrictions on our deeper reality. And death will take them away anyways, like sooner or later, regardless of what we may do. Like there's nothing we can do against it. And in that sense, the sacrifice of the mind really is the only way to real awareness. So this mind sacrifice is symbolized by cutting off the head. And it indicates the discrimination of the mind from the body and the freeing of consciousness from the shackles of the body consciousness. And once this is done, our consciousness will no longer be confined either to our body or our mind. And we'll see like this opening up of the like infinite space of the supreme consciousness. Um, and I mean, it's interesting, like one, one could imagine, for example, like why do we need such a, like it's a very drastic image, right? To cut off one's own head, like, why do we need to be so literal in that de description? But I think, I mean, I was thinking about it for a while and I think mm, the pain of the ego sacrifice is something that maybe really no one wants to experience even once we recognize that it's super necessary. Because, I mean, in a way, it really causes a total reorientation of our energies and in that sense, it's like being reborn. And I think that's why um, this drastic or dramatic um, image, I suppose is appropriate to what might be the most transformative experience possible for us. And if you look at her, um, at, at her head and her face, like she's not in pain or something, you know, she really represents the joy of transcending the body, not the pain of losing it. And in that sense, she really is also maybe the most energetic form of the goddesses and shows the power they have inherently of transformation in action. So in that sense, a severed head is not um, dead, but in fact, more alive. Um, yeah, consciousness is not limited to the body. It's really like out there and waiting for us to connect to and expand, like this expansion again. And maybe you're wondering why it's three uh, streams of blood, blood that spurred from her severe head. So um, they represent really the um, the Sushumanari, that's the, the central one, the one where the Kundalini rises, and which in fact brings us to enlightenment. And then there is the Ida and the Pinyala, the solar and the Luna, the male and the female. Um, we will speak about the Nadi also more um, next week, but this is just like, you probably have a question, why it's three, and it's three for that reason. So we come to Dumavati, which is um, associated with the Anahat Chakra, the heart chakra. Um, so when you see that picture, um, 
might be surprising, but she is really um, very different from all the other Mahavidya. She is portrayed as thin, as an old woman with really like disheveled and like like loose hair. And I suppose in a way she looks a bit fearful, definitely unattractive and dark somehow. Her face is super wrinkled, like she's definitely old. And then we see her teeth, like some are missing. And she's like, on this picture, she's dressed really simply. On some other depictions, she is almost like dressed in, in dirty, like um, clothes. And also in other pictures, like her breasts are really hanging down. The other Mahavidya, they have very like full and beautiful, like vibrant breasts. Whereas like pads are really hanging sort of like, Almost there is no life. And um, she is usually related to um, the bird, the, the crow. So Duma means smoke. And as such, Dumavati is the one who is composed of smoke. So her nature is not illumination. Like there were several other Mahavidya who whose um, force and quality was related to illumination or, yeah, burning away. But Dumavati really is related to obscuration. Now, if we think to obscure one thing means also to reveal another. So by obscuring or covering all which is known, Dumavati reveals the depth of the unknown and unmanifest. So she obscures what is evident, what everyone anyways can see in order to reveal the hidden and the profound. So in this sense, Dumavati represents some kind of a darkness on the face of the deep, the original chaos, like the obscurity which underlies all of the creation. She's the darkness of primordial ignorance. Like, we don't really know who we are or why we are here or where we are going or what do we, like, what do we want? Um, like, our life almost is like, I don't know, a limited light between two greater darknesses, like before birth and after death. And like, Dumavati is really this goddess who embraces or like, smokes us on both sides, who guards us. Dumavati also represents the void in which all forms has been dissolved and nothing can be any longer differentiated. However, this void is not like, it's not mere darkness. In a way, it's like self-illumining and it's free from the um, object-subject duality of our world here, of the ordinary world. And in that sense, she is the true void or the immaterial state of consciousness itself. Like she is that kind of pure and perfect and full awareness in which there are no longer any objects, like really this like primordial state before anything happens. And as you can like see, she is the eldest among the goddesses. And then like, like that, she is the grandmother spirit. She stands behind all the other Mahavidya as their ancestral guide almost. And as such, she is the spirit, like the great teacher who teaches the ultimate lessons of birth and death really. Now, this is Bhagalamukhi, and she, in the chakra system and the structure that we looked at, she is related to the Manipur chakra. And we, as you already see in this very strong image, like she's another form, like another of the frightening forms of the goddesses. Her color really is yellow and gold. She is dressed like in usually in yellow um, clothes and yellow ornaments, and she's sitting on a yellow or golden throne. And with one 
hand, she catches the tongue of her opponent. And with the other hand, she sort of is about to strike him on the head. And her aspects are to stun, to stop, or to end, or to paralyze. So among the Mahavidya, she represents the hypnotic power. And Bagala literally means robe or bridle, and Muki means face. So Bagala Muki is the one whose face has the power to control or to conquer. And in that way, she is like the power. She is the power, but she also gives us the power to overcome hostile forces. And in that sense, she is similar to Bhairavi. But Bhairavi, she burns away everything which is not meant to be there with her fire, with her light. But Bhairavi, she really only sort of freezes the thing as it is. So that's um, the difference between the two. Like in Bhagalamukhi's terms, like negativity is not so much a force that has to be destroyed or dissolved, but um, it's more like a distracted mind or state of mind that has to become, like has to be brought to rest, to silence, to stand still. And in this sort of freezing or still standing aspect, Bhagalamukhi is a very, very important goddess for yoga. So many yogic practices, they aim at developing the power of stambhana, which literally means stopping or sometimes paralyzing. And on the outer level, that might mean like to paralyze or to stop someone who or something that would attack us. And in Bhagalamukhi's um, case, it would mean to destroy them by the power of speech. And it's also sometimes um, the power to hypnotize someone or something to get them act according to our will. And of course, like, I mean, this is on an external level, but if we go within, this really means the mastery of our own thoughts and energies. So yeah, this is like all that we want to achieve with yoga, right? Or I mean, not all, but this is one of the very important points. And Bhagalamukhi, like she grants us complete control of our movements and also the capacity to stop them at will, which is a very like important power. And it also um, sort of develops detachment because it prevents us from becoming identified with what we do. And of course, like to promote this awareness, we must learn to stop and observe ourselves during ordinary daily activities, like literally stop ourselves in mid motion and to observe our state of mind. Um, or, and this is also another aspect of her, the observer, the state of the observer, like Bhagalamukhi as the observer. Like we can continue like doing our action or our sadhana, but we observe what's happening, the thoughts that are coming, like we're the, the seer. And so in a way we might have like forgotten ourselves and like our essence, our, our soul, our Atman, and that we may have become almost hypnotized by the external condition or the attraction of like external objects and identities. And Bhagalamukhi really helps us to break this external hypnosis. Um, and she causes us to lose interest in the idea of the external reality and really radically like to draw within. So now we are coming to a very different um, goddess. This is Matangi, and at the first glance, she might look like Saraswati. The main point of similarity might be the Veena, which she plays. And she's also often depicted like Saraswati, 
holding a book and a japamala. And together, these um, symbols represent the interrelated aspects of sound, knowledge, and power. The sound of the Vina represents creativity, which is the power of consciousness to express itself. The mala also represents the power of sound, but in the form of the mantra, like more sort of um, more disembodied in a way. And the book, of course, stands for wisdom and knowledge. Um, and on this picture, there is none, but often, oh no, there is actually one. Usually she's depicted with two parrots, two green parrots, which are also, of course, associated with speech. So Mata literally means thought or opinion. And Matangi is thus the goddess power which has entered into thought or mind. She is the word as the embodiment of thought. And she also um, relates to the ear and our ability to listen, which in a way is the origin of true understanding, which forms powerful thoughts. Like that's the precondition for it. So Matangi bestows knowledge, talent, and expertise. And she is the goddess of the spoken word and of any like outward articulation or expression of inner knowledge in general, like including all forms of like art, music, dance. So um, earlier when I, when I um, spoke about Tara, I said that there are three goddesses in the Mahavidya which are related to speech and that I would later speak a little bit about it. So there are Tara, Bhairavi and Matangi. And um, each of them in a way is associated with different aspects of speech. Like in the Vedas, it's coming from the Vedas and Tantra like also uses it. There are four levels of speech. And the three goddesses, like three, like, three levels in the sense of more manifest and more unmanifest, more internally and more outward expression. And these three goddesses represents two different layers of these four levels. Um, and like Matangi, like she's related to the more gross um, forms of speech or aspects of speech. We'll speak also about this in detail next week about the four layers of speech. There's also um, one more interesting aspect about Matangi. She is described as an outcast and as impure, which is again, very interesting if we think about um, the idea of a goddess being impure. I think it's really great. And maybe this is only Tantra is able to bring this together. So this impurity in a very concrete way might refer to her descent like to her ancestral history. But also on another level, this might refer to like the nature of the spoken word, which is in a way inherently limited in what it can express. And the idea is a bit that only if we look to the power of Matangi, who is behind the screen of words, we will be free of impurity, which is inherent in trying to put anything into words or express anything in any way, in any form. Like the word is making things profane. If we think about it, I mean, it happens often to us. If we name something, it often causes us to misapprehend or devalue the thing itself. Like not even speaking about all the misunderstandings that are being caused by our inability to really express the soul of a thing and so like i don't know numbers titles descriptions or like explanations like they oftentimes become barriers in our actual contact with um yeah the soul in things really and matangi is the goddess who rules over these um articulations of language and gives the power to use them in the right way and to go beyond them. Um, and she is the goddess who is related to the Svadhisthan chakra. So now we are coming to Kamlatnika, which is the 10th and the last of the wisdom goddesses. 
And as such, she shows the full unfoldment of the power of the goddess in the material, like in the manifest sphere. And as such, um, Kamlatnika is the beginning and also the end of our worship of the goddess. Like mostly, usually, I think everyone like first approaches the divine to seek help for really the ordinary human needs like food, sleep, a house, um, some money, um, health, um, like some people around which we can trust. Like these are really sort of the like basic things and only like, yeah. And she is the one towards whom we like tend for asking these things. But also like, if we think like, if we complete our understanding of the divine by seeing its presence everywhere, like Kamlatnika is really probably like the, um, like she, she represents to like luxury. So she is the tantric version of Lakshmi. So if we look around like uh, temples in India, she really is the most venerated and worshipped form and most present also because, yeah, she like she's very earthly and very um, very present in here. So um, you can see she's sitting not like her throne is a lotus, and um, like Kamala is one of the many Sanskrit names for lotus. And in Hinduism particularly, but also in many other East Asian countries, like lotus is the most sacred flower. And there is again this, um, this symbol or this image of unfoldment, like, or like at the one time, like it's the um, opening of the lotuses through the different chakras of the subtle body, like growing from the root, right? But also, like, where does the lotus grow? It really grows in the mud, like in the like very muddy water. And like then it grows through the like water up to like the light and really like produces the most like beautiful flowers. And at the same time, the lotus is also like a really great um plant in terms of um energy supply like its seeds gives like lots and lots of energies when we are taking it in as food so that's there as well so as such she is the goddess of fertility beauty prosperity and health and she really nourishes and supports whatever we truly aspire to do and she aids and projects and ever seeks to promote the fulfillment like on this very earth, on this very world. And yeah, she she really can be like she can be prayed to both for the ordinary worldly goals, but also for the spiritual realization. But it's also important to keep in mind that the ordinary goals that we seek through her or from her, like wealth, I don't know, fertility, um success like financial help like they should all be part of a more bigger seeking for the divine fulfillment in life like almost as the the basic the foundation for the lotus of the um spiritual um i don't know enlightenment or fulfillment to bloom um and not as like a mere, um, I don't know, satisfying of like, I don't know, almost like neurotic desires or wants. Like it's really this fundament to let us grow into this sort of divine consciousness. And as such, like she's the most sort of earthly and, and like related to the root chakra, like the Muladhar chakra. So this is now you have a little overview over the um over the one second let's start over the Mahavidya. Um and in the next week we will really go into detail into each Mahavidya in 
more in theory, but then also really studying the yantra, mantra, and go into meditation, how to invoke them, how to really sort of bring certain aspects of them to us. I think we could either now, Bodhi, should we do the questions first, or should we yes. do? Thank you, Lisha. It was interesting to understand all this Tan Mahavidya. So let us know if you have any question. <clears throat> you can write either on the chat or you can unmute yourself. Yes, Pradhania, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, actually, I did put that in the chat. A very, very interesting discussion, Lisa Ji. It's very... Uh... Very, very interesting. I, I don't have words. <laughs> and pictures are mesmerizing. I mean, they are just something out of this. I guess it's part of your you guys' energy also that comes with the pictures, right? It's, it's yeah. Anyways, I was trying to figure out Mother Baglamukhi, uh, very interesting depiction. She has, uh, what does a peacock feather for her mean in her picture? I notice in her crown, she has the crane head and the peacock feather along with the moon, present moon. I guess, um, thank you so much for um, your question. And also that you, I'm really happy. We are happy that you enjoyed it so much. Um, as for your questions, I guess the, the peacock really stands for like beauty, rebirth and wealth. And I think I will, I mean, I'm not, Necess uh, exactly sure why it's Bagalamukhi especially because it could be really with any of the um Mahavidya but I, I mean I think it must be related to that I will make a research until um next week when we speak about Bagalamukhi it's an interesting question thank you so much and um as for the pictures I mean we for sure can send you them into the chat also I think um next week after like we will dedicate one day each to like to each Mahavidya. And I think afterwards we will not only provide the recording, but also a brief um, PDF with the most important um, points or aspects and qualities, and also maybe some um, like image material. Um, but this will only be next week. Brilliant, thank you. I would love to have those pictures though. They are out mm -hmm. of this world. Mm -hmm. I know you will print it out and put it on your altar. <laughs> ah, I'll probably print it with them, or I'll probably use them when we are, uh, of course, when when we are chant, when we are doing the sadhana. I'm sure mm. you guys will have that, but I will probably use them when in the homework. <laughs> yes. I'm I'm a visual person, or I'm not gonna put that label on me, but that helps. Me. Thank you. I know. Thank you, Pradhanya. Thank you so much. Any other question? There is another question in the chat. Um, Ma Kali is for which chakra? Mm. So, as we mentioned, there are um there are different ways of structuring um the Mahavidya and also different ways of relating them to the chakra. So, in the system we represented today, we presented today she is um, outside of the chakra system. She is like before the chakra system. So she um, is related to the um, um, tamas guna, which is sort of the dull and almost like dormant sort of energy, um, immobile in a sense. Um, I can also send a picture later in the, into the chat um, for that. I think Vodi, you know, um, she is also in in some other um structures she's represented to the heart chakra right yes so there are the different sadhana basically all this um, mahavidya basically some tan very deep tantric practices which are not for the household so what we are creating here for our daily life basically how we can use these practices as our daily sadhana, not to leave the world, not to go in somewhere in the cave or to practice because there are different purpose and different things related to this sadhana. So we are making it very simple so anyone can practice. We don't, don't need a specific kind of guru to practice here, but you can practice by yourself. 
this all this mahavidya sadhana yes anyone any question now hello yes. sir hello sir uh, like if we do mahavidya sadhana for different goddesses can't it be that we do mahavidya sadhana only for goddess kali yeah it's it's depend like so we go it's like a, we learn to all the goddesses or maybe let later in your practices you connect to one goddesses more so you can go through that so i uh, matlab we like we i worship god ma kali so hmm. can we just limit ourselves to worshiping ma kali only is depend upon what like i in the beginning i told you some people are more software some people are more mechanical so what do you want to bring in your life basically through the understanding of this mahavidya not just the kali not just the tara not just the baglamukhi to see how we can bring this so this is just a tool basically we have the different tools and we can invoke them in when we need them basically okay okay sir thank you hi lisa hi budi a uh, very wonderful session um i'm a musician actually so i play sitar and i'm from malaysia so last year i went to calcutta to take a sitar from my guruji that was my first visit to calcutta and uh, i'm not a very ardent practitioner of yoga but um um when i wanted to go there my family was telling me that you have to go to kaligat and mm. in my mind i was thinking that oh this could be the same place where um ramakrishna paramahamsa mm -hmm. the maharishi i thought that could be the place where he actually mm. meditated on kali because mm. he is a you know he attained realization that no one could have you know achieved like in this mm. era so i thought that was the place and uh, my guruji was staying i was i stayed with him for about one week with his family and for some reason that whole seven day i couldn't go to the temple but it was just like um seven minutes away from his house so on the last day when i was on the way to airport i was actually uh, telling myself and i thought i don't know i just feel like i i want to meet you you know kalima i i i'm not a very pious person but i really had that feel so on the way my guruji said there's no way you can go to this temple because uh, you already late you're going to miss your flight but trust me in that same taxi i saw a small picture of that kali and i told her like um you know I, my purpose here is not only to take the sita but i wanted to have this connection i know i'm feeling something inside me and uh, i think i want to see you just make sure this car stops in a place where when i open the door on the left side it should be your temple i want to do i want to see you that that at that point you know that we trust me there was a argument in the car mm -hmm. and the car really stopped exactly in front kaligat and it was definitely at the left side of the door no <laughs> oh my goodness i i will never forget that whole experience mm. i went inside there and my guruji and my partner had to carry me so that i can see her she was at, yeah. at the top so i i looked and i was like keep looking for few times they had to carry me few times just mm. for me to see her and i was keep telling that no i can't see her i can't see her i can't see her and then i realized it's just like a small you know it was just a third eye mm. and i know i was just crying i and then on the way back i didn't speak to anyone and i start googling and when i start googling i get to know about this dasa mahavidya and for the past one year until today i've been trying to find somebody who can guide me into this meditation i remember texting bodhi uh, i don't know whether i can join this course or not i'm having this financial issue and everything but i think if i doll i didn't meet my guruji i would definitely wouldn't know anything about this this tantra mm -hmm. and this dasa mahavidya and once i came back to malaysia 
I get to know that it's not the same temple of where Ramana Maharishi Ah uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa Hamsa actually meditated in that place. He didn't. He was meditating in a different place, right? Ah, uh, uh, Bodhiji, I think yes, he yes. meditated, right? Mm. So I thought there's something about this tantra. Why it is always about Guru Shishya? There's something, you know. And ah, uh, when I came back. I got to know about Matanki, and I start reading on Kalidasa the poems that he created about Meghatuda, and I realized that he actually mentions a lot of things that um, nobody could could even predict it, and it's true. He even mentioned about Yaksha in his poem, where he clearly stated that there was a land in the sky, and it's really true when they compare with Mahabharata and. Um, um, All other scriptures. So I think this Devi, this this Tantra is is a very big uh, Vidya knowledge, like what Lisa said, and um, it's it it will be a very privilege. And I think it's something to do with previous birth or your your family tradition or anything that you did in your past. It's what that carrying it or giving you that hints to continue in this birth. and i just don't want to lose that opportunity i think it's my bhagya to be able to connect to bodhi ji and definitely with lisa it was very wonderful session lisa not only i get to know that she was actually outcast which i didn't knew and uh, i think knowledge is very big so we may think that we know something but every new thing is a vidya everything is just new and new and new and Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. I hope I can join this this thank session you. more and more and connect to the devis and uh, I would be able to find what is my true calling. And thank yeah. thank you again. Thank you. I'm so sorry to drag this this whole <laughs> bit thank long. Thank you for sharing your experience. It's wonderful. Thank you. It's our thank desire you. basically. How when we we have some desire of something, it will. come like the baby desire for food it will come so we are all the small babies it depend upon our, our desire basically our intention it will manifest in somehow we don't know how but it will <laughs> thank you Yes. Anyone? Any question? Then we will finish this with a short breath awareness meditation. We are not going to the mantra meditation today because it will be night and it will be a little a strong practice. Okay. So I think we all are ready. <clears throat> so I will I will send you the all the information about how to join about all the pay, payment information by tomorrow. so let's bring yourself come back again from all this information <clears throat> bring your awareness back on your body notice how do you feel right now bring your awareness to the body and with the close eyes notice which goddesses you are connected more just with this a small information little understanding about different goddesses which you feel more connected now maybe you can see the picture maybe you can notice the quality
what image is coming in front of your close eyes or it can be multiple pictures or it can be a single picture Now let's join the palms in Namaste. Taking the blessings from all these goddesses. Asking their blessings. Shanti, Shanti, gently rub your palms, gently touch to the eyes, face, and slowly, gently open your eyes. So, Lisha will send you the pictures uh, if you register, and if you are registering for the course, you can print out these pictures. Basically, it's good to have the hard power, hard copy of the pictures. Good to connect. So, so more information I will send you tomorrow about the details, timing, other things. Uh, yeah. So, I hope I will see you on this ten days journey of the Mahavidya. So recording I will send you after I will upload and if you miss something you can again go through the recording. Okay. So the next yes. is I was in the chat. When is the next class? We will start on 9th April, um, which is not this week starting tomorrow, but the week after. Um yes, and then from that day on, 10 days every day we will study and practice together and the time timing, is the same. timing I, I will i will share you so i will send you in everything in the group other than that if there is any question you can either ask me personally or to the leisha sir it will Thank be you. only saturday sunday or continuously continue it will be continued and day from 9th to 18th Okay, so take care. Have a beautiful, yeah. lovely evening or night or day. I'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Good evening.